All right, we're going to get started. First off, happy Thursday. Hope everyone's having a great week. Just want to welcome everyone to CRISPR Office Hours, Season 4, Episode 2. As, you, as many of our guests who are joining us from previous episodes, as well as new ones, we've been hosting CRISPR Office Hours for the past three months or so as a way for the community to get together and tackle the challenges that are presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. And with that, we always want to make sure that everyone has a chance to interact, that everyone has a chance to ask questions. And so we ask everyone to use the chat window to send in your questions, um, as well as mute yourself. And all the CRISPR Office Hour episodes will be on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Synthigo. And this one will be on in the next day or so as well. So again, thank you for joining us. And we're really excited for today's episode. I want to introduce myself. My name is Aditya Vempati, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo. And as always, I'm humbled and privileged to be joined by my co-host, Kevin Holden. Hey, Aditya, and uh, welcome everyone to another uh, episode of CRISPR Office Hours. So I'm your co-host, Kevin Holden, head of science at Synthigo. And the title for Office Hours this week is CRISPR Functional Genomics of Brain Disease and COVID-19. Um, I'd also like to welcome back, um, actually by popular demand, uh, Jason Carlson Stevermer, Jared Carlson Stevermer, excuse me, uh, who's our lead research scientist in cell biology at Synthigo. Um, some of our long-term viewers rem may remember, uh, he's had some previous appearances um, on CRISPR office hours over the past several months. So welcome back, Jared. Hey guys, good to be back. Happy to keep my streak alive of, I think, uh, one guest appearance per season here. Going strong. All right. Okay, so um, our, our mantra over the past few months here um, has been to keep calm and carry on. And our version of it here at Synthigo is to keep calm and CRISPR on. So please stick around uh, until the end of today's episode and we'll let you know how you can get a special, uh, a special edition Synthigo keep calm and CRISPR on t-shirt. And uh, as our lead designer and producer Bobby tells me, um, the t-shirts are now in the warehouse um, due to the COVID related delays we've had. They're finally gonna be shipping out to our friends and viewers uh, pretty soon. All right, without further ado, I'd uh, like to introduce our guest today, Professor Martin Kampman to CRISPR Office Hours. Martin is an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco's Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases, and also an investigator for the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Hi, Martin, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. So one thing we like to do, Martin, um, with every office hours to get people excited, warmed up, and a little bit icebreaker is start with the poll question. And we like to always, you know, subject our panelists, guests to this to understand a little bit of their quirks. You know, we are all in a pandemic and sheltering place, so a little bit of fun here. The poll question this week is, what quarantine cliches did you pick up? And to our audience, please go ahead and select the number and put it in the chat window and read a few of them out. One, downloading TikTok. Two, Online shopping therapy. Three, baking bread at home. Definitely seen this a lot on Instagram. Bleached hair. Our uh, executive producer has uh, gone down this route. And I can say it's yielded phenomenal um, bright results. Adopted pets. Knitting and cro uh, croquet. And then the last one, started an indoor garden. So, Martin, which one have you picked up here? Well, I would say the closest on that list is baking bread at home. I've definitely started to cook more at home. Um, yeah, the real big, uh, I guess, uh, thing I picked up uh, during the pandemic was uh, COVID-19 research in the lab. So <laughs> more work related, but also new and exciting. Great. What about you, Jared? Uh, I, I think I have to go to number three, but not breaking bread, just baking like desserts, baking bars, cakes. We've also started a new indoor garden. My wife has got super into putting house plants all around. All right, Kevin. Um, yeah, I guess for me, it's been um, doing some uh, gardening, uh, putting some uh, garden pots together and, and hanging baskets um, just to attract, uh, you know, hummingbirds as well. So that's basically where I've been just been trying to um, reconnect a little bit with nature in a small way that I can. Nice. I think I have to go with uh, number two and three. I've been starting to shop online for food while baking more at home. Don't ask, it just works somehow. 
a lot of our audience um i've seen has uh started to go in and say a lot of them said number seven here so a lot of started an indoor garden and another one just put in joined a doomsday cult all right sounds like a great choice here <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah great all right let's get started here okay so we're very excited to have martin on today he's been actually um anything but on lockdown the past three months um so uh he's been very busy he's uh, actually just had a very nice review article on crispr based functional genomics um for neurological diseases that was published in nature reviews um and also uh the release of this online data comments for for functional genomic screens called crispr brain which he's going to talk about uh not to mention his lab actually working on some really important covid 19 research um so martin um, thanks again for taking the time to, to join us today. Before we talk about um, all of this and your latest work, can you tell us a little bit about where your lab is located and what makes it a really special place to work? Sure. Um, my lab is located in the building you see on that uh, slide. So we are on the Mission Bay campus um, of UCSF in San Francisco. And um, uh, yeah, right now the building is pretty empty. We work in shifts as many other people I'm sure do uh, on this call as well. But I have to say um, the, the, the reason that it's a wonderful place is, is really the people in my lab. I'm so proud of my lab members who have been really making the best out of this difficult time who, who are you know, open to working, coming in quite early or staying quite late so that to give everybody a chance to work on their projects. And um, who, who really were the driving force to say we as a lab, even though we normally study brain diseases, neurodegenerative diseases um, and others, um, wanted to also contribute to COVID-19 research. So it's really, I think, that the amazing lab members who, who, who are making my day a joy every day. That's fantastic. Um, so I guess maybe now you can tell us a little bit about um, kind of the, the, the grounding, the foundational uh, functional genomics work and what you're, that you're last focused on and how you use it for a platform uh, for discovery. Yeah, I figured I, I start off by, uh, by telling you what I personally mean by functional genomics. Um, you know, um, I think these are really exciting times for biomedical research for many reasons. One of them is that we have so much next generation sequencing capacity now that we can do human genetics as a, at a whole other scale through genome-wide association studies. And on this slide, you can kind of see the types of results you get from those studies, which are uh, genetic variants across the genome that associate with different diseases or other traits of interest. So we have this growing catalog of those, but really the next challenge is to understand how they actually work. You know, what, is it, what does it mean that a specific SNP gives you a higher risk of this or that disease? How does it act in which cells, when in, in a person's lifetime? And then how can we use that understanding to design therapeutic strategies? And um, if you want to show the next uh, next uh, animation here for that slide, uh, this is a graph from a review by Alice Chen Plotkin's lab that really emphasizes that problem. So what you can see in blue here are the bars that show how over the last 10 years, the number of human genetic studies, GWA studies, have steadily increased. We have thousands of them now. But what you see in orange here is not the x-axis of the graph. It's actually telling you the number of functional studies that have been done on these GWAS heads. So really, we have this huge uh, lag, lagging behind in terms of understanding the functional importance of, uh, of these GWAS heads that come from human genetics. And so um, the way that my lab and others are trying to bridge that gap is by functional genomics. So that's the next click. Um, so functional genomics provide a way to, to really f understand the implications that specific genes have in cells. And obviously CRISPR technology has been incredibly transformative for us to query gene functions in cells. And I think that's the next slide. Just giving an overview, I think we have a mixed audience and I think everybody who is joining for CRISPR Office Hour is, is familiar with this um, uh, type of CRISPR application, which is to introduce cuts into, into the genome for the purpose of, of gene knockout or gene, genome editing. Um, so that allows you to, for example, inactivate a gene in a reverse genetic way to understand what its function is. Um, it also allows you, for example, to model these disease variants that come from GWAS studies to make isogenic cell lines to understand um, what, uh, how a one base per change in the genome sometimes can lead to a cellular defect. Um, 
And we at UCSF have, uh, have actually developed other tools uh, to also use CRISPR technology to query genome function. So one of them is shown here, that's CRISPR-I, which uses a catalytically dead version of Cas9, DCAS9, fused to functional domains, in this case, a repressor domain. Um, and that can help to repress gene expression. So it's a way to not change the genome, but in a inducible, reversible way, knock down gene expression. And next one um, would be CRISPR-A, CRISPR activation, where we can fuse activation domains to switch on gene expression. Um, what's, what's interesting about these tools is that rather than knocking out a gene completely, they tune the expression levels. And so in some sense, that is interesting because it might both model what you have in disease states where a lot of the SNPs, the GWAS hits, are actually non-coding and might just affect expression levels of genes. So we can model that here. And also, if we want to identify therapeutic targets, a lot of um, drugs are not going to uh, get rid of 100% of a gene or a gene function, but modulate it up or down. So in some sense, also these CRISPR-IA tools are great complementary tool to CRISPR knockout, CRISPR, CRISPR editing to, um, to understand potential therapeutic targets. And so Martin, uh, quick question. What kind of circumstances would you want to perform a CRISPR-I screen versus a CRISPR-A screen? That's a great question, Aditya. So basically, um, CRISPR-I, you could, you could say it's loss of function, CRISPR-A is gain of function. Um, how can we, you know, what, what, how can they give us complementary answers? In some cases, they really give you truly, um, I think, the two <coughs> Uh, sides of the same coin. So we have done parallel CRISPR-I, CRISPR-A screens, where basically um, tuning up a gene or tuning down a gene gives you the opposing phenotypes, right? So for some th things, you can really think of this as a dial that can go in either direction of the normal expression level. But there are also, and, and actually, if you click to animate the next thing, that's one graph that, that basically shows an example on that. Um, so here's a gene that we can tune up and down using a combination of CRISPR-I and A. In this case, we were looking at infection of cells with ricin, a plant toxin or intoxication. And um, you can see that this enzyme, if we dial it up and down, sensitivity to ricin goes up and down. So that's kind of a symmetrical situation. There's many examples where you, however, get complementary information from CRISPR-IA. I'm just going to give the two most common examples. So for example, if you have a multi-subunit protein complex, knocking down any member of that subunit could, could have a phenotype because you disrupt that function. But overexpressing a single member of that, that complex might not give you a phenotype because, uh, uh, you know, just overexpressing one wheel of a car is not going to give you a, a car that drives faster, right? Um, so you have, um, um, you have that, that is an aspect where CRISPR-I can give you more hits. And in general, it often gives us more hits than CRISPR-A. However, CRISPR-A gives you different type of information. So for example, with CRISPR-A, you can switch on genes that are normally completely not expressed in the cell of interest, right? You could never give them by, get hits for them by CRISPR-I because they're not expressed to start with. So therefore, um, CRISPR-A can, in some sense, help you investigate the biology of what ha would happen if you activated something in a cell type. Um, one cool application for that, for example, would be to ask if we want to differentiate a new cell type, right? And we want to ask what is the transcription factor that we can switch on in order to drive the stem cell to become this particular type of neuron, for example, right? That's a question where CRISPR-A might be very powerful to identify things you can switch on to, to get new interesting biology. So Martin, okay. obviously you guys are, you know, experts in the CRISPR-I, CRISPR-A machinery and getting into different cell lines. Um, what is best practices for you guys in terms of in introducing this machinery? Is it in lentivirally integrated? Is it safe harbor locuses? Uh, what's the best practices you guys use? Great question. Um, we've done both. So, so what I should say is it, at this point, it's quite difficult to make these machineries recombinantly, um, whereas we can you know, there's great Cas9 protein that you can have as a recombinant protein. These CRISPR-I and A machineries 
you know, we haven't quite optimized how to make them recombinantly. So as you said, um, Jared, we need to express them in cells. Um, we have done that successfully with lentivirus. Um, in some cell lines, lentiviral constructs could get silenced. As I mentioned um, um, just in a, in a few minutes, um, we, one big focus of the lab is to work with iPSC technology and to have st cells derived from iPSCs such as neurons and glia to model brain disease. And so for those cell types, we found that sometimes lentiviral machinery gets silenced. And so for, for that reason, we develop a, some constructs that can target a safe harbor locus in those cell lines where it doesn't get silenced. And we, in fact, use CRISPR technologies or talents to, to target, again, those machinery constructs into specific places into the genome. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, so, and, um, you know, we can perturb one gene at a time, but what we like to do for functional genomics applications is to do genome-wide screens um, or focus screens so we, ca we can, we can ha have libraries of guide RNAs that basically target, for example, all protein coding genes in humans or only the druggable genome. And um, again, in a typical application, we would use um, uh, lentiviral libraries to deliver them to cells in order then to, to look at the impact on phenotypes of interest. Um, but uh, one of the things we're interested in going forward would be also arrayed screens for some of the phenotypes where we need uh, uh, high content uh, phenotypes. Yeah, Martin, I was going to ask that, like, when, do you, when would be the time that you actually make that decision? Like, would it be you make you do an array screen just early on if you know you have a small number, or is it more to follow up um, with your hits that you find or, or to go focus later? Great question, Kevin. So um, our philosophy, and I can only speak for our lab, is that um, the pool screens are, are nice because they're very scalable and, and fast. Um, and and uh, we like to see, for a biological question that we address, often think about, is there some way we could do this in a pooled manner first? Uh, because we can do it easily genome wide, and then we would go arrayed and and uh, as a secondary screen, uh, you know, order guide RNAs for the top hits from that and have them in an arrayed format to have a more in depth characterization of each gene perturbation one at a time. So I think, um, you know, of course, they may, some people on the call might be interested in in screening for phenotypes that you can't couple to a pooled readout, and in that case you know, they would have to go arrayed right away. And, and in that case, probably they need to have some strategy to think about genome-wide is, is still very tough to do arrayed. So can they, can they nominate genes that they're most interested in to, for, for that arrayed screen? What's, um, I guess, and let me ask another question is maybe for some of these different types of uh, screens you would do here, um, can you just maybe give us a few types of examples of what types of phenotypes you'd be able to pick up? Yeah, absolutely. You know, actually, um, maybe the next slide is actually a great, uh, you, you're very good at guessing what I'm going to say on my next slide. This, uh, this talks about um, establishing our screen and platform in neurons, but it gives exactly examples of the different screens we do. So maybe this is a good starting point. So, and this is really work driven by uh, um, a student, now postdoc in the lab, Ray Lin Tian, um, where we, we said, okay, CRISPR screens up to that point have been mostly really done in cancer cell lines, transformed cell lines, but not differentiated human cell types that are not cancerous. So if you want to study um, uh, diseases other than cancer, such as brain disease, um, we were very motivated to establish CRISPR screening technology in IPC-derived differentiated cell types. And we started with neurons. And so again, here we integrate CRISPR I machinery into a safe harbor locus into the IPSCs. And then we can deliver guide RNAs and differentiate into neurons, glia, and even 3D organoids. And, and so what are the screens we can do as a pool? So if you click on the next um, uh, animation. Oh yeah, sorry. This is just to show you that using that system um, to target um, in green here, a um, neuronal protein called progranulin. It's actually a disease-involved protein. Um, you can see that by microscopy, we get very good knockdown in the differentiated neurons. The green protein goes away almost completely with the guide RNA targeting it. So this is an example where we do CRISPR-I, but the knockdown efficient knockdown extent is actually quite strong, and we show that by qPCR and Western blot as well. Um, okay, if we go to the next. Um, actually, Martin, oh, I, had a, I had a real quick question. You mentioned before that. Um, you had CRISPR A, you were using CRISPR A to find specific types of neurons. Um, are you, 
what kind of spe specifically what type of neurons are you guys going after? Is there a very small subset that you're, you know, rare subset or uh, difficult to differentiate subset that you're looking for? Great question, Jared. So, um, so I said that as an example, it's something yeah. that's a little aspirational for us, although um, I can tell you that we're actually starting that right now for other, an, another cell type that's uh, of high interest, which is the microglia. Microglia mm -hmm. have been implicated more and more in, in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, and it's still a challenge how to make them from iPSCs. And so, um, so we have some protocols where we're now using CRISPR-A to refine uh, you know, what, how can we get uh, a, a efficient homogeneous microglia? Um, as for neurons, there are certainly things high on our wish list. And those are those neurons that are either specifically vulnerable or, sp or resistant to disease. So one of the features of brain disease that's really fascinating is, and again, let's take something like Alzheimer's disease, is that specific types of neurons suffer a lot in the disease and others seem almost completely resistant. That's even true in people who have neurodegenerative diseases with point mutations in a protein like tau, where tau is expressed in all the neurons in the brain, but it only aggregates in, <clears throat> in some neurons and it's only toxic to some neurons. So if we would understand why some neurons have this um, you know, environment that protects them from, from those, these toxic processes, we could maybe learn the lessons uh, from those neurons to apply, uh, to turn it into a therapy to make other vulnerable neurons resistant as well. So we are very interested in making the specific types of neurons that are either very vulnerable or resilient in diseases. And um, so we want to um, um, find protocols to make those so we can model that. Hey, hey Martin, too, not, not to get you um, off, too off track here, but just real quick, I can see the level of knockdown is very dramatic here. Um, how does this compare to like some of the previous, the kind of the legacy technologies like RNAi um, and your ability to use those in, in this type of cell, for example? Yeah, great question. So RNAi, obviously, in the pre-CRISPR uh, days, right, BC, it, it, it was the method of choice to do functional genomics in human cells. And um, I have worked with RNAi before in those days. And you can get very good knockdown with RNAi. The big, big difference is, and I work very much on that uh, as a postdoc myself, the big difference is that RNAi has off-target effects that are really, really um, uh, pervasive. And, what, and, and, and they come from the fact that for RNAi, you, know, you only need a perfect match in a seed region to mRNAs to affect their expression levels. And it's given the complexity of the transcriptome, right? Um, the seed region, like with seven, seven nucleotide specificity is almost impossible to uh, avoid some kind of off target. And um, that has made it actually very challenging um, to, to do robust genome wide screens. People have done it. There were some famous examples where different group did, for example, RNA eye screens for HIV host factors and four groups did it and there, there was almost no overlap in the hits, right? And, and, and that was just highlighting that at scale, these RNA eye screens are tricky. We, it can be overcome by massively scaling this up and make it, making ultra complex libraries of RNAi, shRNAs. Um, I, I was involved in, in those efforts, um, but uh, but ultimately CRISPR was a big breakthrough because um, it, um, you know even though it has non-zero off targets in this context of functional genomic screening, it is very superior to RNAi. I think I can say this very much firsthand from from knowing both technologies quite well. All right, great, thanks. We'll let you carry on. <laughs> Great. And so, so now, um, Kevin, to your earlier question, what can we do in a pool? The simplest conceptual screen is a survival screen. So we can introduce a library of guide RNAs into cells, and then we take snapshots of that population as an early time and a late time, and just see whether some of the guide RNAs either drop out or increase in frequency by, by doing next generation sequencing of the guide RNA sequences. And so basically, um, uh, what we found is that um, there are certain genes that are essential in all cell types, housekeeping genes, for example, right, that, that cells just need to survive. But we also found genes that are particularly important just for neurons to survive and not for other uh, cell types. And we even found things that we can knock down and the neurons survive better. So those are, of course, of great interest. So that's a very straightforward uh, screen conceptually. Um, we can, however, also get much more um, 
uh, in-depth phenotypes. And one of the attractive ways is to couple it to single cell RNA sequencing. So basically we can um, capture by 10x a sequencing, for example, droplet-based uh, single cell RNA sequencing, not only the transcriptome of the cell, but also the guide RNA that was in that cell. So even though we started with the put guide RNA, we can differentiate um, at the sequencing stage, which guide created which perturbation. And so you can imagine that's a very powerful way to look at cell states, such as stress states of cells or disease-like states of cells, also for differentiation screens that would tell you about cell types. So that's a technology that's, that's very exciting and that we're doing a lot of now. Um, one thing that's not on this slide, um, because it was not in the paper, but we have a preprint where we do that a lot as well successfully in neurons is um, fax-based screen. So using fluorescence um, activated uh, cell sorting, you can couple this to a lot of readouts that you're interested in in cells. You can build a fluorescent reporter for a cellular function of interest, right? You could ask how active are um, is the autophagy pathway or how active are the mitochondria, things like that. You can also use antibodies to look at levels of proteins or even signaling states of proteins. You can even look at, look at specific aggregation states of proteins in neurons. And that's something that we're doing. So fax is another way that you can get a lot of information from, from pooled screens, actually. But then the last thing on this slide is an example where we also did arrayed screens. Um, and um, those arrayed screens, um, if you click one more time, are a good way to um, uh, get at really complex phenotypes. And this, in this case, we followed neurons over time, we looked at their morphology. Um, going forward, we're starting to look at other neuronal properties such as electrophysiology. So those are some of the, the properties that would be really hard to implement in a pool screen that, uh, that arrayed screens are great for. Yeah, so I, I mean, I personally love arrayed high content screening. It, the longitudinal imaging is there, but from firsthand experience, like this becomes a lot of just data and hands-on, especially with the sCRNA seq um, what do you guys end up doing with that? How do you actually do the analysis? Yeah, great question. So um, people like Ray Lynn, who are here, here, here on the slide, are, are, uh, I'm lucky to have uh, amazing trainees who are both good computationally and, and um, um, experimentally. So we do a lot of our data analysis on, online. We are big proponents, of, uh, I mean, in-house, uh, we're big proponents of open science. So we always make available our entire uh, bioinformatics pipeline, so both for the single cell RNA seq screens as well as the morphology, you know, extracting features from neurons and stuff. We always share our pipelines um, so that other labs can can apply or adapt them as well. But I have to say that um, as we're getting more and more data in, we're getting more and more interested in, um, for example, machine learning techniques to really get even more out of having these uh, these large scale data sets. And so. Um, uh, that's something that uh, going forward, I think, will play a role. And hopefully, either through collaboration or recruiting more people to our lab, uh, we, we can uh, uh, go deeper on the large data sets that we have. And actually, yeah, the next slide is, is in fact, a perfect, perfect transition to that. Um, so because we, we are now making all these large scale data sets from different human cell types, we decided that we want to share that with the community and also, in some sense, provide a platform or data commons for other people to contribute their data. Data. And we launched this just a couple of weeks ago. It's called CRISPR Brain. You can check it out, crisperbrain.org. Um, and this was a collaboration between our lab and a group, uh, Data Technica International, that kind of spun out of the, the NIH of, of computational experts. And, um, and, and so uh, if you go to the next slide, CRISPR Brain's goal is really to um, there are some other databases uh, focused on cancer, but we wanted to focus on differentiated human cell types, not cancerous uh, cell types, and really make the data available in an interface that would enable all users, even with no computational background, to explore and visualize data from different screens, and importantly, also to cross-compare them to each other directly, including things from different labs. That's up to now has been very difficult, right? You would have to go to the original papers, download the supplemental, write your own script to kind of compare different screens, standardize them. And so we want to make that, um, democratize that and make that available to everybody. And so, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to giving this plug. It's early days and we would love people's feedback. So if you check it out um, and use the feedback feature on the, on, on, on the website or just shoot me an email with, requests for other features you'd like to see, bugs, 
other ideas and we'd love groups to contribute. So if you have, um, um, if you're doing these kinds of screens yourself, we'd love to feature your results on the website as well. And, and again, there's a, a contribution uh, uh, button on the website or you can uh, email me as well. Hey Martin, it's, it's really great um, to, to get this data, like you mentioned, um, put into uh, a single place uh, where it's easy to access um, and actually also it to visualize um, compared to like just pouring through and downloading tons of data from online journals. Um, can you show us a little bit about what the user interface looks like? Yeah, exactly. So we put together a little uh, demo here. It's a pre-recorded video, but I, it shows some of the highlights. So again, um, one of the key points of uh, CRISPR brain is the ability to look at different cell types. So we visually show the cell types we currently have on the line, some primary, some iPSC derived. Um, and and uh, then you can click on a cell type and uh, search for all the screens that were done. In this case, for example, looking at glutamatergic neurons, you can look at different phenotypes that were done in different libraries. So for example, a, a, a genome wide library here. Um, uh, and then um, for example, phenotype, we're going to look at survival-based screens, but survival could also be done under different conditions. So in this case, let's compare um, screens that were done under standard conditions versus uh, conditions in the absence of antioxidants. So this chronic low-level oxidative stress that's thought to be important in brain aging and, and disease. So here you can easily visualize the uh, scatter plot of how these screens compare overall quite the same, but there were a few hits that really uh, differentiate and, and, and genes that become important in survival of mild oxidative stress. In this case, actually, all the genes we identified were related to ferroptosis, which is quite cool, and our bioarchive paper um, that's out right now um, delves into the details of that. Um, so that's an example for comparing some of these more simple low dimensional screens. You can label the genes, you can sort by them, you can export all the data, you can link to external uh, um, uh, resources and so on. Um, so now let's explore uh, some of these really high content phenotypes such as the RNA-seq. Oh, somehow that cut off the second half of the video, I think. Can we go back? Back to the previous slide. Okay, and can you just try to get back to the middle of the video so we can show the RNA-seq part of the data? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, if you can start playing from there. Um, so RNA-seq screens were again these screens based on single cell RNA sequencing. And so as you can see, we get really rich data sets here. In this case, you have different genes being perturbed. You can zoom in and you can see for knockdown of these different genes, each row is a knockdown. What are all the transcripts in the cell that change expression? And there's a lot of patterns to this. In this case, we're looking at perturbing genes involved in cholesterol homeostasis, and they upregulate a whole bunch of things involved in lipid biogenesis. Again, you can, you can hover to display uh, these different uh, um, these different transcripts and uh, yeah that might be getting to the end of that uh, of that demo but yeah there's much more to see and do on the website so please go and and check it out I think um, we hope to make it useful for the community so any suggestions feedback crit criticism you have is is super welcome as we hopefully expand this into the future and Jared to your point we would love to include high content imaging data for example as well in the next version. Yeah, I think this is a super great resource. I mean, I can you can immediately see the functionality of it for somebody, you know, people that are neuro disease experts or people that are even getting in the field. Okay, did you uh, do you want to move uh, move ahead now? Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, as I mentioned, uh, one of the big motivations for us, if we go to the next slide, um, to do um, uh, to establish a CRISPR functional genomics platform in iPC derived cells was so not only so we can look at relevant cell types. Can we go to the next slide? Um, but also to be able to directly work with patient cells where patients have specific um, uh, genetic variants that are disease linked. I think we're stuck on this slide, at least for me, it's not advancing. I 
Hey, there's some uh, slide loading issues for <laughs> the lar large file. Uh, he's trying to make move it forward. Okay, I can always screen share for my my screen as well if you want me to. Okay. Let me see. Okay, perfect. Um, and again, here's where CRISPR technology comes in. So the exciting thing is that we can actually take a blood cell or skin cell from a patient who has a disease associated variant and we can use CRISPR editing now to make, for example, an isogenic control line. So we have two lines that should really differ at the disease locus. Then we, um, you know, uh, this is after reprogramming uh, into oh. IPCs. Um, and at that point, we can introduce, for example, our CRISPR-IA machinery, guide RNAs, differentiate those cells into the cell types that we think are important in the disease, and then look at um, cellular defects or, you know, cell states that, um, that are disease relevant because they reflect what happens in the, in the patient brain. And then we can ask, how do you go from a single point mutation to that um, cell state that is disease related? Um, and for that, we could do a genome wide modifier screen. And, that, and if we go to the click on the next uh, transition. Um, so basically, you know, imagine one of the things we're doing in lab, for example, is to look at aggregation of proteins that are linked to disease. And so we could ask, okay, um, we see more protein aggregation in the disease background than in the healthy background. Let's do a modifier screen for all the genes in the genome that affect that aggregation phenotype, for example, that we can look at by facts. And then um, you can compare the disease background and the control background. If you click on the next transition, you can see that, uh, you know, of course, we, we might identify a lot of things that are in gray uh, along the diagonal. So they would affect the phenotype uh, in both the wild type and the disease variant strain. And, and so maybe general protein folding factors and stuff like that. But the, the blue heads along the y-axis here are those modifiers that specifically modify the phenotype in the disease background. And so that's interesting because that could now give us a clue for the specific pathway by which a point mutation leads to these, these cellular defects. And if you click one more time, obviously um, the one class of hits that, that is of particular interest are those that even though you have the disease background, they can correct the cellular defect because those are potential therapeutic targets that might be uh, helpful in the patient. And yeah, as, uh, as Kevin mentioned at the beginning, um, I recently published a, a, a review in Nature Reviews Neurology that has a ton of information about, um, uh, about these um, uh, types of screens and, and how we think about uh, you know, going forward in the future with many more applications as well. Um, if you can't access that, I'm happy to send you the PDF if you email me. So Martin, I have a quick question about the IPSC differentiation that you guys do. Uh -huh. um, do you guys ever see that there's a problem, I guess maybe because you're in a pooled state, you don't see this, but that your CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A machinery um, interacts or represses the differentiation pathways that you're looking for? Yeah, in some cases, that might be exactly what you're interested in. We're looking at some neurodevelopmental disorders where we are screening during differentiation. And in that case, we're really interested in what controls differentiation itself. But in other cases, if you want to look at mature phenoty phenotypes and mature cells, you don't like that. And so we have inducible versions of CRISPR-IA. So we can introduce guide RNAs, for example, at the IPSC stage, but we switch on uh, CRISPR-IA activity at the um, post-differentiation. So that way we avoid interfering with differentiation uh, with, with the knockdowns or overexpressions. But that's a real, uh, you pointed to a very important problem, absolutely. Can you, uh, can you tell us what's happening here in the video we're watching? Oh yeah, this is uh, just to show that uh, we are going beyond single uh, uh, cell types at a time. And Emmy, uh, um, fantastic graduate student in the lab, has pioneered these uh, assembloids in 3D of neurons, astrocytes, and microglia, where she can now curb uh, gene functions in specific cell types and, and look at impacts, um, and also um, mix and match different disease backgrounds to try to dissect in which cell type specific disease genes actually act. So this is, um, you know, they're brain organoids that are a great system, but they take very long time to develop. So we develop this system as a very fast way to uh, do genetic screens and, 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 and study neuron glia interactions. How, how quickly did those assemble compared to like versus um, growing out a brain organoid in a dish? Organoids can take um, months to years to really mature. It depends on the phenotype that you're interested in. 
um, the uh, these assemblers, we basically um, can assemble them in, in a couple of weeks. And depending on the phenotypes we're interested in, we might take it out another week or so, but they're definitely very fast to, to assemble. The astrocytes, if you want very mature astrocytes, we have a separate pipeline to mature them that also takes um, a little longer, um, but, um, but certainly, um, you know, this is weeks rather than months. So it makes a big difference. So uh, just a quick pivot. Um, you guys mentioned that your lab very quickly pivoted to COVID research. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's the next slide. So we had a really fun fantastic team of volunteers in the lab, Raylan, Avi, Marissa, Gokul, and Cheyan, who decided, uh, you know, rather than sitting at home, they wanted to actually start new research projects in COVID-19. And I have to say we're at a fantastic ecosystem for that here at UCSF and Gladstone. Um, uh, I know Nevin Krogan was uh, previously a guest on your show and, and um, we're working with him as well as Bruce Conklin, Jim Wells as UCSF. And we started to work and this is how we got chatting with Kevin and Jared here at Synthego um, as well to um, uh, on, on this major effort. And so basically our lab is not set up for BSL-3. So we initially started to think about what are important readouts for COVID-19 that we can look at in our lab. And one of them was just binding off um, the viral spike protein to cells to understand how that first docking step works and what controls it. We know that spike protein binds to ACE2, but um, importantly, we wanted to understand are there co-receptors? And also, what are the things that control ACE2 expression levels in cells that naturally express ACE2? Because we figured that that could be a therapeutic target. If you found a way to downregulate ACE2 and, and thereby the, the viral receptors, maybe you could block infection. And, um, and so actually, I'm, I'm, the timing is such that like last night, we got our first screening results back. Um, so a little too fresh to say, but interestingly, ACE2 was the, the top head. And if you go to the next slide, that's kind of what we expected. And this was an experiment that was made possible by working with uh, Kevin and Jared, actually, um, on the next slide. Because uh, before we even did a genetic modifier screen, we just wanted to validate that that um, the spike protein binding is dependent on ACE2. And so, so um, uh, thanks for the for your guide RNAs for this. We got a really nice ACE2 knockout uh, Calo3 cell line, and you can see that the binding of spike protein to the Calo3 cells is completely blocked uh, when you knock out ACE2. And not surprisingly, our CRISPR eye screen, where we just got the data last night. ACE2 is the top hit, but we found a whole bunch of other hits. And, and, and I think those would be really interesting to also look at for as potential therapeutic targets. All right. Um, thanks, Martin, uh, for telling us a little bit about that. And, you know, it's been a pleasure for us to start to collaborate with you as well. So, um, you know, thanks for uh, entertaining that possibility uh, with Jared and I. Um, I think we're going to uh, wrap up now and go into questions uh, from the audience. So maybe just a little shout out uh, about your lab and, you know, if, you're, if you happen to be looking for anybody to come work with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, a great, uh, a great lab. Fantastic people. Um, these are our funding sources as well. Lots of thanks. Um, yeah, we are definitely interested in people um, who are, who want to reach out to us. It's a little hard right now to to onboard new people in the lab, um, but you know, hopefully that will change soon. So so be in touch if you're interested. And also, um, of course, we're looking for computational people as well. As you as as Jared pointed out, you know, we're generating a lot of data, and there's a lot of opportunity for computational analysis. All right, great. Um, okay, so we did have a couple of uh, questions from the audience that were submitted um, ahead of time. Um, and we, we do have, we know a lot of you have submitted questions as we've gone through here. Um, and so if we don't get to them today, um, we'll send them along to Martin and uh, we'll see if he can uh, uh, take a little bit of time to respond to them. Um, somebody asked the question, this is kind of interesting, uh, 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 Monsai. Um, is there a known permanent impact of COVID-19 to our genes? That's an interesting question. I wonder if there's a way we could pull that down using functional genomics. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, on long time scales, we absolutely know that the human genome is under selective pressure from pathogens, right? It's, it's actually one of the major forces that shapes, uh, shapes genome evolution at this point is, is uh, ways in which uh, humans and pathogens have interacted over long time scales. So yes, I mean, if COVID-19 is, is here to stay, I, I, I would guess, even though I, that's, 
are not an evolutionary biologist that 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 maybe you will see some selective pressures on human gene variants that 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 help people respond to it it's possible yeah um i don't think that it is um you know uh, on the on the short run doing that maybe but uh um, again, I'm not a virologist by training. That's a disclaimer. We just got into this and really more of a cell biologist. Yeah, I, I guess I just followed it up by saying, um, you know, when there's with any disease that ever uh, uh, passes through or any pandemic, there's always a subsection of the population that's sort of naturally immune to infection uh, through one way or another. And it could be that uh, some people are more naturally immune to COVID-19 based on the um, genotype of their, their ACE2 um, uh, protein as well. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, okay, it looks like we, we also had another question. And so Joseph at UT Southwestern um, asked if, um, uh, you know, have, have you taken a look at this paper? And I know maybe it's an interesting question to ask in the context that now, now you're working, you know, with Synthigo a little bit on the, the, um, the array validation um, and, and looking at doing, um, you know, a CRISPR, CRISPR eye screen for um, uh, the ACE2 and, and SARS-CoV-2. So maybe, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that paper is very exciting. I think, uh, you know, well done. It it came out after we started our project. So um, having said that, this was really based on infection. Um, our paper um, is based on the on the binding. So what we what I would expect is that in, um, you know, some of the hits that um, that were found in that paper might overlap with our hits. Certainly, it's it's it's, it's quite useful to have different phenotypes because it also helps you then rapidly differentiate which of the hits maybe in, in this paper from uh, way at all uh, where about binding versus other steps of infection. And they obviously did some nice work on that already. Um, they did their screen in vero 2 cells. Um, uh, so whereas we did it in a human cell line, Scalo 3. So I would say the, the one nice thing about our screen that where it might have some potential to also find new additional things is that we did it in human cells. Great. Yeah, um, I think Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's interesting too that, you know, there's different approaches to this because you guys are very much looking at like the upstream, what actually regulates, the, what, what regulates ACE2 and how do you get the infection versus the downstream regulation as well and looking at the intersection mesh points between those as an area that's ripe for a bunch of information. Yeah. Um, so Martin, we did have uh, another question that came through the chat actually uh, from Brian, um, and it's going back a little bit more to to uh, to your work in the, in the GWAS study. So um, the question is, I, I understand that screening and GWAS lead to a large number of hits. Um, how many of these hits do you typically validate with cell models? Um, maybe assuming if you have unlimited funding or, you know, it was really cheap to do this thing, um, you know, would increasing the scale of your model creation change your research in any way? Great question. Um, so we have up, up to this point worked with a limited number of cell lines that are say disease variant versus isogenic control and then we do modifier screens. But there are new CRISPR applications such as prime editing that we're very excited about because they might enable us to model in really high throughput a lot of genetic variants, right? By, uh, by targeting them through prime editing. Prime editing is certainly itself, you know, obviously still a new technology, it's efficiency and, and also off targets remain to be really optimized, I think. But having said that, I do believe that in a, in a high throughput screening setting, you could use it to screen a lot of genetic variants in parallel. Um, the other part of the question was, um, how strong is the effect size? That's a really good question because, um, and I think there's two caveats to that. Um, GWAS studies are super sensitive to pick up on genetic variants, even if the, the, their impact on the disease is relatively minor. In particular, common variants tend to have a relatively small effect on disease risks. And, uh, and so maybe we, don't, we can't always expect a strong effect size for those. Usually familial genes that are kind of giving you with 100% penetrance a disease in kind of a, a Mendelian manner, they could be expected to have stronger effects on the cellular level. Having said that, um, you know, we can do go combinatorial. Um, there are these polygenic risk scores, so we could make cell lines where we have several of these risk SNPs that might all add up. And some people have done that for, uh, Kristen Brennan has done that for schizophrenia, for example. And, um, and yeah, and, and the other question is, of course, some of these diseases, you know, maybe a cellular defect that is small can accumulate over a lifetime to give you a disease. And so the question is, on a reasonable timeline in the lab, what can we see? And, and so those are all open questions and, and areas of development. Yeah, I, I think we're all start, kind of starting to wait to see if Prime is really uh, ready for prime time yet. Um, <laughs> but 
Um, I know at least something at Syntico we've been working on is actually trying to develop the ability to make those um, those sim models in high throughput um, and just doing those with traditional CRISPR-Cas9 knock-ins uh, yeah. with, with donor DNA. Um, and so we've gotten pretty good at that. And so, you know, I think Martin, that's going to be an error. We'll, we'll have a conversation uh, about that later on um, at some point. Um, all right. So um, I think we're going to wrap up now. So um, uh, thanks, Martin, again for, for joining us uh, uh, today. And uh, maybe, Aditya, do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, great. And thank you, Martin, for joining us today. So uh, next week, who's going to be on the show, Kevin? Yep. Uh, next week, we're going to be joined by uh, Miguel moreno Mateos. He's a uh, PI at the Andalusian Center for Developmental Biology in Sevilla in Spain. Uh, Miguel's lab utilizes CRISPR-Cas systems in zebrafish, actually, to help them understand developmental biology and also human diseases. I know they're interested in neurological disease as well, and zebrafish are a great model for that. Um, Miguel kind of has an interesting story about what happened to him during the pandemic. He was actually due to take part in this Latin American zebrafish conference right before it broke out in Peru um, that actually we were sponsoring uh, for them as well. And he had, uh, he has a kind of an interesting story about how he had to get back to Spain, which at the time was literally one of the big hot spots for COVID-19. So um, it should be interesting to, to hear his story. And then also um, to wrap things up here, we want to make sure, as Kevin mentioned earlier, to collect your keep calm and CRISPR on shirt, just go to syntego.com slash com to fill out the form and collect it. All right. So um, thank you again, Martin, for joining us. Um, I just uh, would also recommend to our audience, please check out uh, Martin's review in, in Nature Reviews. Um, it's a brilliant review of the um, of, a, of ways that you can use functional genomics to perturb um, and you know, for discovery research um, in with CRISPR and CRISPR A. Um, also, thank you for, for building this CRISPR Brain uh, platform. And I think it's going to be a highly valuable resource. And we're really glad that you were able to come on today and tell us about it. And hopefully you get a lot of engagement and uh, interaction. And of course, we'll, we're excited to keep working with you on the, the COVID-19 uh, work as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Martin. And uh, thank you, Kevin, as always, and Jared also. Yeah. Have thank a good week, me. everybody. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And goodbye. Bye.